Hello and welcome to this special broadcast of Tech Today, where we dive into the latest advancements in technology and explore the potential risks and rewards they bring. Today we focus on the ever-evolving world of artificial intelligence and the growing concerns surrounding generative AI like ChatGPT and Google Bard. Join us as we examine the perils of the cutting-edge technology and the impact it may have on our future. Well, what if I told you that opening link on the show was not written by me or my team, but actually penned down in a matter of seconds by ChatGPT? How is AI transforming our lives, our businesses and society at large? What does the AI revolution mean for jobs? And what sort of safeguards do we need to have in place for the AI revolution coming our way? So many questions and on Tech Today, we're hoping to get some answers from one of the biggest voices in the world of AI. This is an episode you don't want to miss. I'm your host Ayush Elavadi and this is Tech Today. Disinformation, deep fakes, and jobs at risk. Concerns about regulation and threats of damaging the society. The stunning rise of generative artificial intelligence has raised big red flags. And so, over 3,000 global technology leaders and researchers, including Elon Musk, Apple co founder Steve Wozniak, and AI scientist Stuart Russell, have written an open letter warning that AI tools present profound risks to society and humanity. The letter says that AI developers are locked in an out-of-control race to develop and deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict or reliably control. It calls for a six-month pause on the development of systems more powerful than that of GPT-4 and asks AI developers and independent experts to jointly develop and implement a set of shared safety protocols for advanced AI design and development that are rigorously audited. At the India Today group, we've been using artificial intelligence in different ways. We've got a news anchor, Sana, who's doing the news through AI. We've generated covers. We had Sundar Pichai on the cover of our anniversary issue for Business Today, uh, an image generated through AI. But I'm very anxious about how you're trying to prevent its misuse and this fear that AI could somehow break free of the controls that you've set for it. How real is that fear? How strong are your guardrails? I think our guardrails are strong. And I also think that we're on a new and winding road. And we're going to have to add and perhaps probably even strengthen guardrails as this road advances. The first thing I would say is, from my vantage point, perhaps most importantly at Microsoft, we've been doing this work to basically build these guardrails for six years. Several world leaders, including US President Biden, have raised concerns over AI. AI can help deal with some very difficult challenges like disease and climate change. But we also have to address the potential risks to our society, to our economy, to our national security. A similar call has also been made in India. Former Niti Aayog Vice Chairman and others have written an open letter appealing to India's policymakers, academicians, thinkers and tech experts to urgently join the critical debate on artificial intelligence and its impact on India. We need a careful and in-depth discussion and also a consciously arrived at national consensus. Is the only way to deal with the threat from AI to shut it down? Or is it too late for that now? To discuss what's happening in the world of AI, I'm joined by a very special guest today, Professor Stuart Russell, one of the biggest voices from the world of AI. Professor Russell, what a pleasure to have you with us on Tech Today. It's nice to be with you. Professor, I want to start off by asking you about this open letter to halt, well, the development of tools like ChatGPT or even smarter tools than ChatGPT and to really develop guardrails and safeguards and safety protocols surrounding these tools. I want to actually refer to a part of the letter which says recent months have seen AI labs locked in an out of control race to develop 
and deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict or reliably control. Now, there's thousands of signatories to this particular letter. You included Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak. There's a bunch of tech luminaries on that signatory list. But I want to understand from you, what was the rationale? What really prompted you to sign this open letter? We're calling for a halt on the deployment of large language models that are more powerful than the ones that have already been released. Um, and the reason is pretty simple. Uh, as as letter says, we do not understand how these systems work. So just for your listeners and viewers, uh, what is a large language model? It's a, it's a computer program that predicts the next word given a sequence of preceding words. Uh, and with that system, you can have a conversation because when you say something that forms a sequence of words and then the program responds by saying whatever is the most natural thing to say next. So, um, you know, if I say happy, you might say birthday uh, and that would be a natural prediction for what the next word might be. Um, so the way these systems are built, first of all, uh, there's a very large amount of training data, so basically lots of sequences of words that are collected from various digital resources. Uh, in the case of GPT-4, we think somewhere in the 20 to 30 trillion words of text, which is approximately the same amount as in all the books that the human race has ever written. Um, and then we start from uh, what you might think of as a blank slate, an enormous uh, circuit with about a trillion parameters or more. Um, and then by the process of doing about a billion trillion small random permutations to those parameters, the system is gradually uh, improved in its ability to predict the next word. So the result of that is something that when you converse with it, uh, has many of the appearances of a, a really intelligent entity. Um, and I've talked to friends who are very sophisticated AI researchers who can't escape the impression that they're actually talking with a real mind. Um, are they talking with a real mind? I mean, interestingly, most people, when you look at how the algorithm works, the training process, you think, okay, it's just gonna learn to um, essentially mix and match lots of conversations that are in the training data and then use that to come up with the response to the present one. So it's sort of somewhere between an intelligent piece of paper uh, and a parrot um, and maybe something a little bit more intelligent than that. Um, but when you ask it, for example, um, you know, I've forgotten such and such a mathematical proof. Uh, could you give me that mathematical proof but give it to me in the form of a Shakespeare sonnet. Uh, and it will write a Shakespeare sonnet that contains within it, you know, a detailed mathematical proof. Um, this is probably not something that's in the training set uh, or anything close to that. So uh, how it manages to do this, we haven't the faintest idea. So I'll say that again. We haven't the faintest idea. Um, do these systems learn their own internal goal structures, right? From all these humans who are, who are writing and speaking, they all have goals. They all have purposes in producing that text. Uh, so it would make sense that the training process would create goals inside the, the computer program. Do they have their own goals? We haven't the faintest idea. How do we get them to behave themselves? How do we get them to stop saying bad words? How do we get them not to give you advice uh -huh. on killing yourself? How do we get them to not give uh -huh. you advice on building chemical weapons? Well, the only way uh -huh. we have of doing that is when they do it, we say bad dog. And we hope that they understand what bad dog means uh, and they stop doing it. But they don't. They keep doing it. You say bad dog again. Uh -huh. They keep doing it. Right. And you say bad dog, you know, a few million times, you can gradually lower the, the level of bad behavior. But 
This is a type of technology that is incredibly unpredictable, incredibly powerful, that's being released to billions of people. We have no idea how it works. This is a recipe for disaster, and we've already seen disasters. For example, systems encouraging people to kill themselves mm -hmm. and actually resulting in death. So all the petition is asking is that we not release systems whose behavior we don't understand, where we cannot guarantee that there is uh, that there is no real significant risk to the public. And in fact, governments, what, what, uh, what, many, many governments over the world have already specified that as part of the AI principles of the OECD. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and, and what the letter also calls for is to develop safety protocols for some of these platforms like ChatGPT and GPT-4 you were talking about. It's interesting because some would argue that the floodgates have already been opened. It's public, open AI has, uh, practically everyone in our office is using ChatGPT. For the opening link of this show with you, we actually asked ChatGPT to come up with that output and it did a fairly decent job, I'd imagine. The real question is, how can we now, with a six-month pause or a halt necessarily, sort of stymie or, or prevent some of these issues that you're talking about? Will that be enough? Is it easy to tame the beast that's already out there? The genie's out of the bottle, Professor. So, I would agree that, uh, to some extent, the systems that are out there are already capable of causing problems. I think the petitioner is asking that we not release systems that are even more capable of causing problems. Um, and we understand that it's very difficult to to ask uh, for a withdrawal of systems uh, that already have hundreds of millions of users. Uh, so so we didn't address that. Uh, I should say I did. I had no role in writing the letter, um, but I was persuaded to sign it. Um, so six months, in my view, actually, is not enough. What we're asking for mm -hmm. is develop reasonable guidelines for what a system has to uh, satisfy, right? What kinds of properties you have to be able to demonstrate convincingly for that system to be safely released, and then show that your system meets mm -hmm. those guidelines. So it may take mm -hmm. time to develop those guidelines. It may be impossible, given the process I just described for how these systems are built, it may be impossible to show that they meet those guidelines. Well, tough, right? If I wanted to build a nuclear power plant and the government says, well, you need to show that it's safe, that it only has, you know, that it can survive an earthquake, um, that uh, it's not going to explode like Chernobyl did. Um, and I say, well, I can't meet those requirements. The government's not going to say, oh, well, mm -hmm. you know, fine, just go ahead and release it anyway. And, you know, we'll clean up the mess afterwards. They say, I'm sorry, if you can't meet the safety guidelines, you don't get to build your nuclear power plant, right? If you can't, you know, build an airplane that doesn't fall out of the sky, you don't get to put passengers on it. Mm -hmm. This is common sense. We're simply asking that common sense be applied uh, in the case of these extremely powerful AI systems. I've been an AI researcher for 45 years. I love artificial intelligence. I think its potential to benefit the world is unlimited. But if we have a Chernobyl, Chernobyl destroyed the nuclear industry. After Chernobyl, the, the number of new nuclear plants basically vanished. And that was the end of the nuclear mm -hmm. industry. We do not want to have a Chernobyl for AI where some really serious consequence, uh, and we don't know exactly how to predict what that might be. Um, yeah. But. I think we need to grow up and take the possibility of serious consequences seriously. You know, it's interesting that you've drawn such an analogy and, and this would really uh, make a lot more people aware of the perils of AI if it, you know, if this goes on unabated because like everything else in the world of technology, there are pros and cons and this genuinely needs a few guardrails. But since we're talking about these guardrails, Professor, would you say 
that this is, well, the onus lies on governments to do this or even big tech should be a little, little bit more responsible or, or eventually should it be a collaborative effort where the governments, uh, big tech companies and us, the user, get, get a, sort of a, a sort of a stakeholder claim into deciding how this AI revolution shapes up? I think it needs uh, all of the above. I think governments, tech companies, uh, experts in the field need to work together. Um, but it shouldn't be up to the tech companies to decide what guidelines they're going to meet. Professor, I want to delve deeper into the world of AI with you. When we're talking about what platforms and tools like ChatGPT and Google Bard can do, and a lot of these language learning models are capable of, the concern for the everyday consumer is, as they delve deeper and start using some of these tools, is that, will this eventually replace me? And the million dollar question is, will it take away jobs? I know there's a whole theory uh, that you can uh, propound to us uh, very well, which is all about technological unemployment. Is that now, 2023, the year where we should be concerned about technological unemployment? Uh I would say it's quite likely that we'll see a uh, significant impact. I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, so mm -hmm. one actually is in the area of computer programming. Uh, and you might find it surprising that advances in technology are going to make computer programmers redundant. Um, but the numbers I've seen suggest that using these tools, you can write software um, five to 10 times faster uh, than unaided. Um, and in many cases, uh, you simply say what you want the program to do uh, and uh, the software just writes it for you. And mm -hmm. that means, it's to me, it's unlikely that the world needs five or ten times as much software. Uh, so that means that we're going to need somewhat fewer computer programmers. Um, but I was also talking to a member of um, the Writers Guild, uh, which in the U.S., uh, is the sort of union for all the people who write uh, screenplays for movies and television shows and so on. Uh, and they are in panic mode because, um, because these systems can, can generate scripts uh, at very high speed. Um, and if they've been trained on all the scripts for all the soap operas that have ever been produced, uh, they can write new soap operas uh, extremely fast. And I don't think anyone expects soap operas to be, you know, mm -hmm. literary masterpieces uh, with amazing originality. So uh, so I think a lot of writers are going to find themselves uh, in less demand as these systems get uh, more and more capable. So that's, that's just two examples. But I think the idea that um, that a whole job Right. If you if you think of a person who works in a company as sort of a node in a network, and you think of what what comes into that node. Well, it's language, right? It's emails, mm -hmm. it's phone calls from boss, it's requests from customers. What goes out? Well, it's language, right? It's documents, you know, sales invoices and and reports for the boss and all that kind of thing. It's all language. Um, so any one of those jobs in principle could be replaced, but we don't trust those jobs to psychotic six-year-olds who live in a fantasy world. So unless you're a psychotic six-year-old who lives in a fantasy world, I don't think your whole job is immediately at risk. We can't trust these systems to tell the truth because they hallucinate things that don't exist and uh, they just want to sound plausible and they have no idea what's true and false so if, if you're an insurance broker right you're not going to be replaced by a system that's that is quite happy to sell insurance policies for houses on pluto uh mm -hmm. you know for five cents each right and and you can't trust these systems to follow policy to mm -hmm. understand your products and so on but i can tell you there are literally thousands of companies who are working mm -hmm. to fix those problems, who are working to make these systems conform to policies, to stick to the facts, uh, and so that they can be used in these important applications. And so that next generation, I think, will have uh, a much bigger impact on employment. 
you know, in the EU, they talk about GDPR and, and, where, and what we do with this sort of data. In India, we're also talking about a privacy legislation at some point, though we don't have one already. And around the world, a lot of countries have started talking about regulating AI professor. When we're talking about tools like ChatGPT, Google Bard and the like, do you think regulation is the way forward? Is it even possible? I know the EU is also thinking about an AI act as we speak. Do you think that legislating upon such topics, the way they are growing so rapidly and exponentially, uh, if, if governments don't intervene immediately, it might be problematic and even a legislation then would not be able to catch up with the beast as it is today? Yeah, so the European Union AI Act is uh, expected to be passed um, by the end of this year. Um, and I've been working with the drafters of the legislation and with the Parliament and the Commission mm -hmm. uh, for several years now, trying to make sure that uh, it makes sense, that it's not going to be obsolete before it's even passed. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as I can tell, systems like ChatGPT would probably not be legal to use in any high stakes application. So the, the act talks about and defines high stakes applications uh, that can, mm. you know, systems that can have a significant effect on, on people. Um, and it asks that there be, uh, you know, steps taken to show that the system uh, behaves safely in a predictable fashion, that it's accurate, that it's uh, fair, that it's not racially biased, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I don't think there's any way uh, to show that these large language models meet those criteria. Uh, and interestingly, on OpenAI's webpage for GPT-4, it recommends that probably you should not use these systems in high-stakes applications. The world seems to be divided on a gentleman named Elon Musk, a signatory to the same open letter calling for a halt on the development of some of these AI tools. I don't know if you've had the good fortune of meeting him before, but he's been very vocal about AI and the way the AI revolution is shaping up. And to give him credit, he's been consistent with his views over the years. Based on your research and your understanding of how things are shaping up, could Elon Musk have been right all along, Professor? Um, well, I think basically, yes. I think the, the point that Elon is making is that until we figure out how to control systems that are more powerful than ourselves forever, uh, until we figure that out, we face a very serious risk that we will develop AI systems that are very powerful and we won't know how to control them. Uh, and it's, it's not as if this kind of thing has never happened. Right. When we look at what's happening with climate change, for example, we developed a system called a fossil fuel corporation, which happens to have some human components. But basically, it's an algorithm that's maximizing its objective, which is quarterly profits for the shareholders. And that algorithm is destroying the world and we can't control it. Right. Everybody in the world knows what's going on that we face this, you know, this progressive climate disaster and we are unable to stop it because we have lost control. Mm -hmm. So that's a sort of, Profe you know, a, a, a miniature version of the kinds of control problems that we're going to face in future with AI systems. Professor, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you on Tech Today and actually discussing the guardrails, the safeguards needed to be in place because we've been talking so much about artificial intelligence and how this AI revolution is shaping up. But to actually know that someone with your experience and your understanding of the world of AI, decades long experience, is actually got a plan in place with a bunch of other tech luminaries. I think the, the call to halt the development of some of these products and actually understand from big tech and governments whether safeguards and guardrails can be put in place is a good pragmatic one and it's been very reassuring and fascinating to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for joining us on Tech Today. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. More importantly, thank you all for tuning into this special broadcast of Tech Today. We're going to cover these sort of topics on the Tech Today website, Tech Today socials and of course on this show. I'm your host Ayush Alabadi saying until next week, adios.
If you like the video, do like, comment, share and subscribe.